U.S. President Joe Biden has paid homage to his Irish heritage as thousands of people gathered to greet him on a tour of the home county of his ancestors. In a speech in a pub in County Louth, he said visiting the area his great-great-grandfather had left for America feels like coming home. Mr. Biden is on a three-day visit to the Republic of Ireland, having spent a short time in Northern Ireland to mark 25 years since the Good Friday Peace Agreement. After stepping off Air Force One onto the rain-soaked runway at Dublin Airport he was met by Tawasich, Irish Prime Minister, Leo Varadkar. He then met distant relatives in the Cooley Peninsula and the village of Carlingford in County Louth. In Carlingford crowds lined the quayside as the presidential motorcade arrived. Mr. Biden later addressed an audience, including some of his relatives, at the Windsor Bar in Dundalk. He said Irish people were the only people in the world in my view who are actually nostalgic about the future. It is because, more than anything in my experience, hope is what beats in the heart of all people and in particular in the hearts of the Irish, he added. Every action is about hope, we can make things better. Earlier Mr. Biden completed a brief but landmark visit to Belfast, where he called for politicians to restore the power-sharing government at Stormont, which collapsed over a year ago. He used a speech at Ulster University to praise the tremendous progress since the Good Friday Agreement was signed in 1998. The peace deal largely brought to an end more than 30 years of violent conflict knows as the Troubles. This place is transformed by peace, made technicolor by peace, made whole by peace, he said. President Biden regularly speaks of his Irish heritage and had promised to visit the country during his presidency. A U.S. genealogist who researched Mr. Biden's lineage has estimated he is roughly five-eighths Irish. President Biden's maternal great-great-grandfather Owen Finnegan departed Carlingford in County Louth in the late 1840s to travel to America. Among his great-grandparents was Edward Blewett, who left the west coast town of Ballina in County Mayo in 1850 to emigrate to the U.S. He settled in Scranton in Pennsylvania as the devastating Irish potato famine was causing widespread starvation. Alongside the tenaced, Irish Deputy Prime Minister, Michael Martin. Asked about his feelings on the visit, the president replied, It's wonderful. It feels like I'm coming home. Commenting on the wet weather, he added, It's fine, it's Ireland. The U.S. president greeted a crowd of about 5,000 people as he visited the border town of Dundalk. Mr. Biden also made a visit to a cafe where he met staff before addressing an audience at the pub. When you're here you wonder why anybody would want to leave, he said. In the coming days, President Biden is expected to speak to politicians at the Wariactas, Irish Parliament, and meet more relatives in Ballina. While we often talk about the special relationship between the US and the UK, that relationship exists mostly at the government level. In the hearts and minds of the American people, however, the true special relationship is with Ireland. There is nowhere in the world Joe Biden should be today but Belfast. A proud descendant of Irish immigrants, the President of the United States of America is today in Northern Ireland commemorating the 25th anniversary of the Good Friday Agreement. It makes sense, the Americans were intrinsically involved in negotiating the deal which ended three decades of sectarian violence between the Protestant Unionists and Catholic Nationalists. The Good Friday Agreement stands as a triumph of American diplomacy and a global blueprint for ending civil conflict. As this timeline of American involvement in the peace process shows, the United States was able to play such an important role in negotiating the Good Friday Agreement because of its unique history. Many of the key instigators of American involvement in Northern Ireland were Irish Americans themselves, from House Speaker Tip O'Neill in the 1980s to President Bill Clinton in the 1990s, who famously granted a 48-hour visa to Sinn Féin leader Jerry Adams, a watershed moment that kick-started the peace process. This should be no surprise. While we often talk about the special relationship between the US and the UK, that relationship exists mostly at the government level. In the hearts and minds of the American people, however, the true special relationship is with Ireland. To understand why, one must understand American demographics and American history. A nation which broke from Britain in the 18th century only to become its staunchest ally in the 20th, we are also a nation in which 31.5 million citizens claim Irish ancestry. That is a population nearly seven times that of Ireland itself, accounting for one in ten Americans, living in every county of the United States. Beyond that, though, exists a kinship that many Americans feel with the Republic by dint of our parallel histories. Both Ireland and the United States are erstwhile colonies of the United Kingdom. As I have previously written, we have Lexington and Concord, 
the Irish have the Easter Rising. We have our Revolutionary War, Ireland has its War for Independence. We have George Washington, the Irish have Michael Collins. In the 19th century, immigration to America from what is today the Republic of Ireland proliferated, thanks in large part to the oppressive laws instituted by the British and, of course, the potato famine. Sadly, the Irish did not find a warm welcome in the United States, though. For example, in an 1855 incident that would become known as Bloody Monday, at least 22, though some Irish Catholics estimated the number was more than 100, Irish were massacred in Louisville, Kentucky. This stigmatization meant that the Irish and their descendants were not assimilated into mainstream American culture, that is, white Anglo-Saxon Protestant, or WASP, culture, as quickly as immigrants from England, and even Scotland and Wales, were. Whereas the Scots-Irish, that is, descendants of Ulster Scots who emigrated to North America in the 17th and 18th centuries, were thoroughly Americanized by the time of the Civil War, the more recent Catholic Irish immigrants from the South were marginalized in ways that kept them insular and therefore promoted cultural retention. Over time, though, the Irish began to be more accepted into polite society, particularly as lace curtain Irish began to attain a level of economic affluence and respectability as opposed to the shanty Irish who were stereotyped as lazy, drunk, and violent. As they began to exert more influence over American life, including American politics through political machines in cities like New York, Boston, and Chicago, their culture began to become ingrained in American culture, to the point where even Americans who were not of Irish descent proudly participated in Irish traditions. Most Americans will know at least the opening lines of Danny Boy, not even realizing that it was written by an Englishman. In the 1970s and 1980s, the soap opera Ryan's Hope focused on the trials and tribulations of the Irish-American working class in New York City, while more recent shows like Roseanne and its sequel, the Connors have centered around an Irish-American working-class family. Not coincidentally, one of the stars of the latter also starred in the American version of Shameless, which centered around an impoverished Irish-American family on the south side of Chicago, a city that dyes its river green every St. Patrick's Day. Indeed, most traditions related to St. Patrick's Day originated in America. These Irish-Americans form the backbone of the white working class, and they vote in numbers that make them a block neither party can ignore. There is a reason politicians and presidents of both parties have felt a vested interest in not only courting Irish voters but also promoting peace in Northern Ireland. The affinity the American people feel towards the republic transcends party lines. It is a kinship forged by shared blood but also shared struggles for independence and self-determination against the British. Some even see the British as an occupying force. One friend's mother has a bumper sticker on her car that reads 26 plus 6 is equal to 1, a not-so-subtle indication that she supports the six counties of Northern Ireland uniting with the 26 counties of the Republic. This is all worth remembering as President Biden visits Belfast today. We can't allow the Good Friday Agreement that brought peace to Northern Ireland to become a casualty of Brexit, Biden tweeted in 2020. Any trade deal between the US and UK must be contingent upon respect for the agreement and preventing the return of a hard border. Period. Biden's visit today underscores that warning to Westminster, as the Conservative Party has not given up hopes that a post-Brexit trade deal might be reached. Ensuring the continual free flow of goods and people across the border is essential from the American perspective, not just because the US rightly sees the Good Friday Agreement as a triumph of American diplomacy, but because so much of the United States is skeptical, at best, of British involvement on the island of Ireland. For its part, the United States must continue to strike the right balance. The Northern Ireland Protocol agreed upon by the British government and the European Union ensures there will be no hard border between the Republic and the province. However, the Democratic Unionist Party has been reluctant to adopt the Windsor framework which would create two lanes of traffic for goods heading from Great Britain to Northern Ireland, fearing that it cuts off the province from the rest of the United Kingdom. The DUP pulled out of the power-sharing agreement in 2021, collapsing the Northern Irish executive. President Biden has called for a return to the power-sharing agreement at Stormont, but his words are less likely to be heeded by the DUP, as many of its members view him skeptically and as favoring Dublin and Brussels. This could show the limits of American influence in Northern Ireland. About the Irish, he said, you're English, you remember that. Then I found out, my sister and I found out the name Robinet, Robinette, my middle name is Robinette. I, uh, I thought that uh, all those years it was French. 
They must have been Huguenots because they came to Great Britain in the 1700s, somewhere along the way. And they're all from Nottingham. So uh, I don't know what the hell's going on here. <laughs> you, you come back, it's confusing. And anyway, Council General Naran Rain and, uh, and Envoy, Special Envoy uh, Joe Kennedy, thank you for your efforts to continue deepening and strengthening the ties between Northern Ireland and the United States. It's good to see Belfast, a city that's alive with commerce, art, and, uh, I would argue, inspiration. The dividends of peace are all around us, and this very campus is situated in an intersection where conflict and bloodshed once held a terrible sway. The idea, as I said, to have a glass building here when I was here in 91 was highly unlikely. Where barbed wire once sliced up the city, today we find cathedral, a cathedral of learning build of glass and let the shine light out in, in and out. It just has a profound impact. It's 10 o'clock. This is Sky News at 10, live from Dublin. The US president goes back to his roots in Ireland, earlier urging the leaders in Northern Ireland to restore power sharing in Stormont. I believe democratic institutions established through the Good Friday Agreement remain critical to the future of Northern Ireland. It's a decision for you to make, not for me to make. The president praises the prime minister's Brexit deal as the White House insists he's not anti-British. Also tonight on Sky News at 10, Prince Harry will attend the King.